and um, this is a little bit of um, information about the uh, our uh, webinar series. This is the second of four, as uh, as was uh, mentioned before. So uh, with that, I think we can probably um, throw it back to Dave. And if there are any questions that you'd like us to attempt, we're happy to do that. Okay, great job, guys. We do have some questions. Are there any targets for 3D color management? Well, none that have been tested extensively. So there's, let me just say, like with any research project, there's lots of ideas, but nothing that's really been tested well. Uh, I think the, the thinking around this is that we can, there are lots of ideas on how to do this. Uh, but now, um, as a, so how do you execute that? I guess is the the greater question. Here, let me uh, let me offer uh, an example. Um, I, I once had an idea of a um, of a hemispherical, um, what they call Lambertian, so it doesn't change with light angle, uh, ob uh, uh, color. I mean, a neutral object. And we've seen these used with, for instance, X-Rite. They've used these hemispherical objects. So I presented this to a very renowned uh, color scientist on digitization. I said, look, wouldn't this be a great tool for at least getting a foothold on uh, capture, color capture for 3D imaging? And the uh, the, the gentleman was quite honest and he said well yeah but i don't know what i would do with that and that tends to be the stopping factor right now is well you can digitize anything and you can think of these great objects but what's the follow-through and that uh, that is frankly what's uh, preventing i claim uh any uh good and reliable techniques for color management in 3D. Okay, yeah, I, I would I tend to agree with all of that. Um, yeah. I would do this stuff. Okay, so this is a little bit of a loaded question, so I try to keep the answer under an hour. Is the maximum delta E value set to 2.4 because that's when the human eye will recognize a color difference? Oh, no. Um, well, I would say that, um, that that was just an example. So for the two, uh, I think, what was the... Uh, in the example we showed, the delta E was, uh, for that criteria, was five. And I think we uh, associate that with a three-star FAGI level. We're saying, okay, and remember, that's the average. Now, and Dave, you could even pipe up on this. Uh, there is this um, claim that the, uh, the delta E of one is what the human observer can detect. And uh, that is probably very nearly true, but only under very strict circumstances and viewing yeah. conditions. Uh, so yeah. that, that's dual stimulus, that meaning you have both samples, A and B, before you. Uh, it's with a, uh, an average observer. It is with under the right lighting conditions. And what I've always been impressed with is if you can't make a decision on if there is a difference, you are forced to make a decision uh, on that, uh, what, which one is different than the other. So uh, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much, though. Uh, because, uh, all I'll say is, um, so to answer your question directly, no, that is not the reason we have that limit. Um, right. And, 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 the, and there's a follow up here that dire directly relates to this, and that is, uh, and I think the answer is go to like FAGI or metamorphosa uh, in terms of what is the commonly accepted tolerance for Delta E2000 in digital heritage applications. And the answer is going to be it depends, but why don't you go ahead and answer that? Depends on the content. Depends on the content. Uh, depends on the content. Depends on um, your ability to manage that, uh, which then leads to cost factors. And we are often confronted with that from vendors and users saying, well, yeah, I can give you a FAGI four star and a, a Delta E of less than 2.0, but uh, that's going to affect my workflow. That in turn affects costs. So at some point you have to say, good enough. 
And I think this goes to where Peter is mentioning is um, yeah. test, for purpose. test for purpose. By the way, um, you can manage these errors with post-processing. Now, mm -hmm. that's a debate that's still going on, whether that's acceptable or not. I claim it is within reason. Uh, I think the word I use is uh, do no harm image processing. Okay. Yes. Um, next one I have here is why is it so difficult to achieve a neutral white patch alongside neutral gray values? The white patch always seems slightly off in regards to neutrality. Ah, interesting. Okay. okay. Well, here, I think I have a good, and Dave, you can help me again on this, but I, I know this isn't your presentation, but um, it, well, uh, it's not impossible to get a, a truly white patch, but once again, uh, it all comes down to uh, cost, uh, durability, and, and frankly, I found uh, its ability to maintain hygiene. Um, so, for instance, the might have, some of you might have heard of Spectralon. Uh, that's very white. It's very neutral. But boy, that uh, you've got to be careful in using that because it does get dirty quickly. So, what we've now started to do, and is because I got caught on this, is that we've noticed that yes, the white always is a little bit off. And this is now why we're starting to veer towards rather than neutrality defined by RGB values, basically all count values being the same for a white patch. We're saying, well, really, we ought to measure that, that yeah. white balance, if you will, white color yeah. metric. So to take into account the small differences and not being quite absolutely neutral. Okay. And we can do that. That's easily done. Okay. okay. All right, so uh, next here, what test targets do you recommend for controlling the digitization of color transparencies? So just if I could ask, there's a lot of questions here, so if we can somehow... Oh, I'm these Sorry, oh, shut up. <laughs> the, the test targets for <laughs> color transparencies, was that right? Color transparent, yeah, color transparencies on motion picture. Can you say motion picture? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like a test target for that. Okay. I don't have a good answer to that. I have some opinions about that, but I think um, they're uh, they're debatable. Uh, they're, they're probably not covered well in this forum. Let me say that, and I, I don't want people giving me phone calls and beating me up. Okay, okay. let me con continue uh, to later to take. Continue to thank you, Peter. Mm. What is the functional differences between a spectrophotometer and a colorimeter, and what justifies the significant price difference? Go, Dave. Want me to do that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, you do that, uh, Dave. Tell you what, there's definitely companies out there that make a spectrophotometer and they cripple the hardware or the software in it so that it only puts out color metric values. And I know this because there's companies that let you upgrade a color emitter to a spectrophotometer with a software, software upgrade. So all the hooks are in there in the hardware and yet they just don't give it to you because you don't pay enough. So, um, these days, uh, a spectrophotometer, I, I think that's the case for a lot of spectrophotometers these days. What justifies this significant? Well, no, the functional differences are a color image is going to be limited to a certain uh, C-Lab values or trastimulus tri values and certain uh, viewing conditions. And if you want to be able to look under different viewing conditions, different lighting, different people, then you really want to go with a spectrophotometer. Uh, and that in my opinion, more than justifies the significant price difference. For the content, I, I would also make an observation that perhaps um, for um, benchmarking, you might do um, the spectrophotometer, but for routine process control, probably a colorimeter might be uh, might be significant. That's, That's fair. Um, a couple of questions have been asked about the slides. Are we going to make the slides available or are we, uh, Everything's in the recording if they want to do that, but what, whatever's up to you guys. You don't have to answer that now. We'll think we can post that. Phase one and Hasselblad are the leaders, but most EU libraries and archives cannot cover the high costs, like over 50,000 US dollars. How to solve this issue in a concrete way? But I, I would say there's, I, I think there's some light on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, many of the high end digital SLRs. Who are much less expensive uh, can 
suit a good portion of what uh, users require. I'll, I'll say so, for instance, uh, some of these Sony cameras that are coming out now. Uh, I haven't gotten any results, but from rumors I hear that they are quite good. Um, uh, but also be aware that, uh, and this goes back to one of the slides Peter says, is that, that uh, megapixels are not necessarily resolution. Mm -hmm. And that uh, you will see some very high claims of, quote, resolution. But uh, my experience has shown that uh, as you get into those higher resolutions, you better know what you're doing because uh, cameras now become more and more unstable in those positions. So objective evaluation is going to help determine yeah, which exactly. way you go which way on that, whether it's a well-known uh, yeah. system or not. Yeah. Um, Alexandre, our friend from Brazil, as you know, the smartphones, cameras, uh, have been very useful nowadays. What do you think about computational photography? It means the computational photography is a part of institutions collections. So I think it's kind of the question is where's what's the role of a smartphone in this archiving world that we're in? Right. So the, right. So the, the implication would be that be perhaps some computational uh, photography involved with the capture uh, of, from smartphone. That's what's is that acceptable? I'm not quite sure of the question there. Probably just, like I said, just sort of a um, generic question about the role of smartphones in computational photography. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I, don't, I don't really have, um, I don't really have any input on that. Yeah. It would be, it'd be great to, okay. to look into that. But yeah, the computational end is not my bailiwick. Yeah. Don't, don't have any. I feel that. Well, there's, there's certainly there's certainly uh, certainly issues with a smartphone in terms of what you're able to actually control. I think they're getting better at that these days. But a few years ago, the control was so difficult that when you try to do real imaging and it's changing the white point or it's changing the white, the exposure at each point, you know, it's kind of impossible to get real science from it. But I think things are better now. All right, here's another one here. I assume the image capture is recorded as raw image file format. Yes. What is the production speed after color calibration is done using the standard patches? What kind of post exposure adjustment is needed, assuming automatically done on some kind of software? A very specific question there. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I think so. Um, we probably can't give a full answer. Um, what might be implied there is uh, automatically building That's custom good. profiles for managing the color. If it's related to color, um, that can be done. Um, but I don't have any uh, really input in terms of the processing speed and the complexity. Um, is color evaluation using standard charts also applicable to materials with translucency? I would Good. say no. Good question. No. The answer is probably no. I, I'll, I'll chime in there. The answer is that you don't really know what you're measuring with that. So yeah, we're going to come back yeah. and say delta E's or something, but you don't know yeah, how that's... to Working. Most of the small area instruments you're using out there are going to do a poor job on uh, translucent materials. Translucent so, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right to say. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, big long question. Time for uh, large of the image is enough for achieving the input refereed appearance. What is the advantage of using other imaging systems like hyperspectral for cultural heritage? So RGB imaging. The input, oh, input referred, not refereed, input referred appearance. Is RGB imaging enough for that? I'll repeat the question. Is good enough for what? Uh, for the achieving the input referred appearance. Uh, I would say, ooh, that the word appearance is is that's a um, that's a hot word because well, Dave, you know that. Uh, 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 <laughs> Using the word color appearance models is gets yeah. to be quite complex. So yeah. uh, I don't know. I don't think that's what the use the questionnaire asked. But uh, if you're thinking colorimetry, I would think it would be sufficient. But uh, well, a simple answer is in this uh, in cultural heritage, you are generally controlling the illumination mm -hmm. and the viewing conditions. And um, multispectral imaging is, yeah. I think, primarily uh, involved with scientific um, 
investigation of particular materials. So that's a little bit outside of the of the sort of imaging we're talking about. Yeah. Here. So one thing I'm going to say is that there's some of these questions that are really long and involved, and I'm just not going to try to feed these to them. It's got, I mean, stuff that they're really going to have to read. And what I will do is make sure these questions are all recorded for the uh, oh, uh, okay. that I'll get, and we'll make sure that these guys get this. Um, and I'm just just a couple left here. Uh, what again? Transparency. What digitization techniques might you recommend for imaging of transparent glass objects? I think we kind of been through all the transparent stuff. Um, translucency. The first question was about slides and motion pictures. Um, it seems like we we in the sciences have some work to do to enable this for these folks. Is that a fair statement? You too. Yes. Yeah. And I I know if users subscribe to Image Muse. Uh, as the list serve, there have been a number of uh, back and forth questions actually handled by the folks at Corning Glass on that question. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but he's been uh, quite active in answering those questions on glass imaging. Okay. So uh, let's, I, I kind of, at some point, we got to cut this off, but. Um, there was one question that came up in the previous uh, webinar with Janine. Uh, with Janine, and the question came up about uh, immersing uh, oil immersion for scanning of film. Uh, that's right. Yes, and I think it was uh, uh, when would that be used, or is that recommended? And I can pass that over to Don. Oh yes. Well, Peter cued me on this, and so I went into my research mode and asked for my contacts and they said well yes uh, film liquid immersion was done it was largely done for what they call drum scanners in the way back days and their assessment of that currently is that the conservators would kill you if you attempted that these days because it would probably uh, change the makeup of the original content and it's it's very hard to clean to do that well. The claim was actually, in a physical sense, the reason that was, um, why that was done was to hide um, scratches and digs and surface artifacts on the film. Okay. And the reason, frankly, that was occurring, why those were occurring was because they, um, it was the illumination geometry, is that it was very uh, specular illumination geometry which really enhanced the visibility of those scratches. So in today's world, if you do especially digitization of uh, transparency material, uh, like with a camera, camera on a stick, capture, is that usually those are diffuse sources underneath. And so that would largely eliminate okay. the, the appearance or the enhancement of those scratches. So, so generally not needed. Generally not needed yeah. these days. Okay. Uh, any anything else? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, we're, uh, we're mostly out here. So as I said, if we didn't get to your specific question, I apologize. Uh, some of these were very long and involved, and we will uh, get all of them to uh, mm -hmm. Peter and Don to see what they can do with them. We okay. have all your email addresses and all that. So uh, I think unless, Susan, do you have anything else you want to add here? I think Susan's still there. Uh, nope. I, I was muted and uh, no, I don't have anything to add at this point. Okay, uh, just uh, our next our next webinar will be, uh, let's see, what day? Next, next Wednesday, I think. Is Remember, the Susan, I want my spectrophotometer back. Thanks for that, Don. Uh, <laughs> let's see. The next, the next webinar is going to be uh, David Wall, Walls, and it is going to be next Wednesday, again, at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, same time as today. And uh, with that, I guess I will say thanks again to Peter and Don for your hard work and Susan for presenting on behalf of ISMT. And we'll sign off now. The recording will be available by the same web link that you used to register for this uh, webinar. You okay. can go Thank ahead you, and share Dave. that. You're welcome, guys. Um, yeah.
go ahead and share that link with anyone you want and we'll continue to share it on our end and uh, this can be uh, watched as often as you please with anyone you want. Um, very good, we're done signing off. Cheers everyone, stay safe, wash your hands, good day.